welcome to the Risen Jesus Podcast with Dr. Mike Lacona. Dr. Lacona is Associate Professor in Theology at Houston Baptist University, and he's a frequent speaker on university campuses, churches, conferences, and has appeared on dozens of radio and television programs. Mike is the president of Risen Jesus, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. My name is Kurt Jarris, your host. On today's episode, we continue our discussion on Dr. Bart Ehrman, on the historian and miracles. Uh, Last week, we looked at two of his arguments uh, in support of his claim that the historian cannot come to the conclusion that a miracle occurred. And those two arguments were that the uh, sources uh, are poor and that a miracle by definition is the least probable explanation, so we shouldn't really uh, take any sort of uh, credence or have any confidence in, in that position. And uh, Mike here gave some reasons why uh, those two concepts were mistaken, looked at some counterexamples, um, and uh, said, well, even if the sources were poor, uh, then uh, we have good reason for uh, thinking everyone's got a bias, and we should um, uh, be willing to evaluate and keep that in mind uh, when we're reading these sources. And with regard to the least probable explanation, well, the least probable explanations occur all the time. And uh, so even if something is statistically uh, small, so minute from occurring, they still occur frequently. And so we should take that into consideration. So Mike, I'm hoping on today's episode, we will finish going through Bart's position. He's got three more arguments. Uh, so why don't we get right to it? So, um, Bart's third argument in support of the claim that we cannot know miracles, uh, is that the claim that Jesus was raised is a theological claim rather than a historical one. Uh, So we've sort of come across this before, but what would you say to that? Yeah, we have come across that before um, with uh, John Meyer, right? Mm -hmm. So John Meyer basically said, as soon as you say God raised Jesus, then it becomes a uh, a theo, a theological argument rather than a historical one. And we looked at that and said, well, to an extent that is correct to say that God raised Jesus or God uh, did this— um, is a the- to, to make a theological argument because historians can't prove that God did it. However, as with Meyer, I suggested that what we could do is um, a form of methodological naturalism. I mean, we have th- two options. We could either do a form of nat- methodological naturalism that says we can affirm that the event occurred but we could not affirm that it was God that did it. The historian could take that um, kind of an approach and just leave the cause of the event undetermined. Historians do that a lot anyway, right? Mm. Um, we, I, I remember, um, um, I'm trying to think uh, of his name, King Ludwig, I forgot which one it was, um, but of the Neuschwanstein Castle over in Germany, He's the one that built that in the 1800s, and then later on he was kind of insane, and he was confined to a smaller castle, um, and then he and his physician went out one night for a walk, and they did, he didn't, he or the physician never returned. The next morning they found them both face down in the water, drowned. Now, um, was it murder? Was it an accident? We don't know the cause of, of, you know, what caused them to drown, but we know that they drowned. We know that they died. So historians have these kinds of things all the time. Charlemagne and Carloman, they, that was supposed to be an attempt to, in the eighth, late eighth century to revive the Roman empire. Um, And the two brothers didn't get along. They split up their empire. Um, And then Carloman was dead at one day. And it's like, okay, well, was he poisoned or did he die by natural causes? Well, we don't know. Hmm. Historians don't know this, but they can still determine that Carloman died. And in the same way, a historian, in a form of methodological naturalism, it wouldn't deny the event occurred, but it would just say that we can't determine what the cause of the event was. We couldn't determine that God did it. Now, I I do want to reiterate here that this is a form of methodological naturalism that differs from the typical form. The typical form would say, uh, at least in history, would say, well, if it was a miracle, you can't even say the event occurred. 
um, which I just think is a, a bad way and an overly biased way mm. of doing it. I like Meyer's way. So that'd be one thing. The other option would be to say that the event occurred and just like scientists deposit theoretical entities like black holes, quark strings, and gluons to explain observable phenomena, historians can posit a theoretical entity such as God to, ex- uh, uh, to uh, account for uh, the data, known data that we have. Um, if Jesus rose from the dead, we would posit a theoretical entity, God, as the cause of that event. I think it's fascinating here that uh, uh, Bart recognizes these distinctions between the theological and the historical. And while you and I would disagree with him on how he parses that out, the, the fact is that he recognizes these uh, is important because in, in stating it the way he has, uh, he's implying the, the position that he thinks dead people don't rise from the dead. And of course, everyone agrees with that. People typically don't rise from the dead, and even the ancients knew that. So when it happened, it was so surprising to them <laughs> that that was, you know, what was part of the central message of the Christian church was like, hey, wait a second, something new has happened here, and we want to tell you about it. Uh, so, I mean, we would all agree with Bart that dead people don't rise from the dead, but here we have uh, an instance in which it's occurred, despite it being rare, uh, extremely rare. And so, you know, we're, we're on common ground there. And so we sort of see here um, the, the importance, the implications, right? Bart recognizes the implications. If Jesus did rise, then we'd have to say that's God and that's theological. So we're, we're, we're on the pa- same page there on the implications He's just not willing to say that it happened. That's that's true. And and just a little caveat. Yeah, we all would agree that dead people don't rise by natural causes. Oh, right, right. Yeah, right. I, I mean, generally speaking, yeah, by natural causes, right. Now, and I remember in his debate with uh, William Lane Craig, which I think happened in 2006, I was at that debate, um, and I, I seem to recall that he said something, well, why say the Christian God would have done it. Why not just say it was Zeus or some other kind of God? Well, I guess technically speaking, a historian, you know, if if I were given that, I would say, well, that doesn't dispute whether Jesus rose. It just disputes the cause of the resurrection. And maybe a historian can't determine uh, the cause. So you would just leave the the cause undetermined, right? But to say, well, how do you know the Christian God did it rather than Zeus? That is just to call into question the God that uh, who raised Jesus. It's not to call into question that Jesus was raised. Mm. That's a great segue to his uh, fourth argument here for his position, Mike. Um, He he, Ehrman says basically that if we accept that Jesus worked miracles, um, we must also be willing to concede that other miracles occurred as well, say in the Islamic religion or other religions or views. Uh, so that doesn't mean that Christianity is true on his view. It just means we have to go a bit further. But and of course, we wouldn't want to do that, would we? <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I I don't think that we would have to acknowledge that if we think Jesus perform miracles. I don't think we would have to acknowledge that miracles were performed in other religions. However, I think if we're going to be honest historians, we we have to be open to looking at the data and looking at the possibility that they did. Um, And I'm open to the possibility that miracles occur in other religions. Um, And, you know, the, the cause could be God. He could be doing it for some reason. Maybe a person doesn't believe that God exists at all, and he's doing it to reveal that he does exist, and maybe at a later time he's going to reveal more specifically that it's Jesus. Or maybe even it's a, a demonically empowered that the person experienced a miracle or something like that. I think we can acknowledge that the supernatural can indeed happen, and miracles can happen in other religions. But I would also follow that some of the examples that he, he uses, like um, Apollonius of Tiana, that it said that he rose from the dead, or Honey the Circle Drawer, um, which, uh, you know, Honey is this Jewish uh, prophet who 
I think he existed in the first century BC, according to Josephus. Um, and um, you, so, so he he asked for rain, and he draws a circle, and he says, "I'm not going to come out of the circle until it rains." And he prays, and it rains. You know, so. Um, you know, when we look at the evidence for that, the evidence he's meant, Honey has mentioned in two sources. He's mentioned in Josephus, who writes at the end of the first century, and he's saying Honey existed 100 BC. And then I think it's mentioned in the Babylonian Talmud. He meant that mentions uh, the miracle in a lot more detail. But he says, I think that it's written 500 years later or something like that. That Honey existed 500 years after the first century BC. Mm. Um, so. I mean, there's some, you could say the gist uh, to an extent is there, but whoa, it is just really, I mean, something is unreliable between those sources. <laughs> yeah, when there are a lot of red Apollon flags. Yeah. And when it comes to Apollonius of Tiana, um, here you have a historical figure who lived in the first century, died at the end of the first century, um, but we really only have one good source on him, and that's Philostratus's Life of Apollonius of Tiana, which is written around the year 225, um, or about 125 years after Apollonius's death. And there's a number of problems with it, and it says, I mean, there's even conflicting accounts whether Apollonius died, or how he died, and then there's only one, even though it said he appeared afterward to some people on a number of occasions, there's only a description of one of those appearances and that we don't know when it occurred. It could have occurred a couple of days after his death. It could have occurred a century after his death. We don't know. But he appeared to one of his followers in a dream. Other followers were around. Apple, uh, the, 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 the follower woke up and said, can you see him? Can you see him? No one else could see him. And he said, I saw him. He appeared to me in a dream. Um I mean, really, do we have to consider that as a legitimate miracle? And there are others, you know, like, uh, to, to I think, to the Emperor Vespasian, and things like that, where he healed two blind men. Um, I think, it, you know, what we were looking at last week, this resembles Hume's argument, right? Mm. How miracle claims in competing religions cancel each other out or what Evan Fales referred to as the demolition derby. This is the same kind of argument, yeah. and I think we would answer it in the same way. Uh, we could apply this to worldviews like atheism and theism. God exists, God does not exist. And do they cancel each other out? Well, of course not. It's where you got to look at the evidence. The evidence for one is stronger than the evidence for the other. And you look at it this way and say, well, when it comes to miracle claims in other religions and in Christianity, there is a significant uh, amount of, of uh, a significant disparity in the kind of evidence we have for the miracles of Jesus versus the miracles of figures in other religions. Right. So we're doing an apples to oranges comparison here uh, <clears throat> when for many, I won't say all, but for many of the claims of religious miracles uh, in other religions, they are private affairs. Uh, it happens to one person or maybe just a couple people. What we're dealing with, especially with Jesus, are public miracles that that occur in front of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And that's certainly something that is of a different context and a different type than these other claims about, you know, uh, a, a particular person having one thing revealed or an experience they saw in the forest. Um, so Yeah, um, but, but you do have some public miracles, like with Honey the Circle Drawer, yeah. like with uh, Vespasian healing two blind guys. So that's not always the case, but the disparity of evidence is, I mean, you just have with the miracles of Jesus, for, for, for example, you have early sources like Mark it would be a, a, our earliest gospel and he mentions the multiple miracles of Jesus. You have multiple independent sources because not only is it in Mark, it's also in John. We also find it in the Q material. So whether you think Matthew used Luke 
or Luke used Matthew or that Matthew and Luke used the common source, you still have another source there that reports miracles of Jesus that may not appear in Mark. So mm-hmm. you've got that recurrent attestation. You've got Josephus who mentions the miracles of Je- that Jesus was a miracle worker. Um, and he is an unsympathetic source, right? Um, So, and you've got it in multiple literary forms, such as you've got it in biography, you have it in historiography, and you have it in letters, because Paul, in the Pauline Corpus, you've got mentioning of Jesus' miracles, you have it in the Book of Acts as well, and in Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews. So, biography, history, and letter, multiple literary forms. This is some of the strongest multiple attestation that we can look for. Mm. So, we don't have that kind of stuff with most of the other miracles reported. And uh, uh, some of the other miracles reported in, in other religions have plausible natural explanations. So for example, the miracles of healing these two blind guys by Vespasian, when it's reported by Suetonius and Tacitus, it almost seems like in some case, they see this more as a staged photo op than they do a, a legitimate divine act mm. that was going. Yeah, interesting. Okay, uh, Ehrman's fifth and final argument is uh, essentially the claim that um, the tools simply aren't available to the historian uh, to conclude on miracle claims. So uh, you use this terminology here. You say um, that historians are unable to adjudicate on miracle claims, and that's what Ehrman says in support of his claim. Sort of almost like just a, a premise conclusion of sorts, sort of repeating his, his position here. Um, but why is that mistaken? Well, you know, as we have discussed with that, yeah, they may not have the tools to be able to confirm that it was God who did it, but we do have the tools as historians. In if the, if the data is sufficient, we have the tools to be able to verify that the event itself occurred and at that point, then we may consider the cause, and we could either say leave it undetermined, or we could say, all right, look, it's extremely unlikely by natural causes, and the context, uh, the event occurs in a context in which we might expect a God to act, a religious context, and then say, well, this would seem, we, in that case, I think we are justified to posit um, God as the theoretical entity who did it. Um, we can go either way. I'm fine with either way. I kind of like to be overly cautious here and just say, well, let's just leave the cause undetermined. If you want to believe God did it, you can believe it by faith, but we can still affirm the, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. I think we can do that. Hmm. Now, that's something that the consensus of scholars aren't going to agree on. They're going to say, well, the canons of history don't allow you to do these kinds of things, to which I would say, well, there are no canons of history. Um, And this is something that a number of philosophers of history and historians have acknowledged. No canons of history. Well, some like Ehrman and some others would say that there are canons of history. Well, that just shows you that there aren't, because historians themselves don't even agree on whether there are canons of history. So, and a canon of history would be a principle that is accepted by all. So, they can't even agree on how to define history. They can't agree on how to define historiography or how much of the history of the past can actually be known, whether it can be known or whether every reconstruction of the past is historical fiction. Um, So, yeah, there are no canons of history. We do not require a consensus Mm. in order to say that something has been verified. Mm. Right. Um, we We can disagree with people and yet still think something happened. I mean, there are times when a minority position ends up being what eventually comes to be accepted, and those people that believed the minority position at the time were right. We think that they were right. Um, So we could think of some examples uh, when when that happens. Okay, uh, good. So that sort of addresses the five positions uh, or arguments uh, of what Ehrman claims and the conclusion that he comes to uh, that we can't claim a miracle happened using the historical tools. But as we've now gone through, <clears throat> these are mistaken for a, a number of reasons. And um, and uh, I want to at this time then also give another plug here to the book here that you've got <clears throat> because there's so much more to be said and that is said 
uh, on this subject matter here, the historian in miracles in your book, The Resurrection of Jesus, A New Historiographical Approach by IVP. Just a wonderful work, uh, nice and thick, uh, a lot of meat there. Uh, and I want to encourage the listener to go ahead and if you don't have a copy, purchase it. If you have a copy, reread it because it's so important for us to uh, be on top of what people are arguing. And we can see how the conversations we have on the street uh, line up with what some academics are saying. And it's really important for us to be prepared to respond to uh, these claims that are made, um, you know, an assertion or an objection and how we can then present an alternative position or response to that. We can be ready to respond to that. Uh, so I think that's it's very important. Okay, let's take a comment from one of your listeners, Chan. He asks here... Um, he wants me to ask you about your current research on the Gospels and what are some of the issues that you are exploring, uh, as well as when you think your next book will be released. Hmm. Well, Chan, um, my next book will, will likely be a popular version of my most recent book on Gospel differences. Um, that book, uh, the most recent one published by Oxford, was an academic treatment. And, you know, it, it was pretty cool, like within, I don't know, two, three, four months of that book coming out, uh, Oxford contacted me and asked if I'd write a popular level version of it because they said it was uh, too academic for for most people. Um, and it is kind of heavy reading. It, 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 for some, it has uh, been drier, a lot drier than, say, the reading in this big book on the resurrection. Um, so what when I was in Indonesia, I had told Oxford, no, I wasn't interested in doing that because I wanted to just move on. I'd already moved on to my next research, which was on gospel reliability, the historical reliability of the gospels. Um, but then I went to Indonesia uh, two years ago, and they had me lecturing an average of six hours a day. I probably did that for 10 days uh, in, I think, uh, three different cities. Um uh, Sumatra, Jakarta, and uh, Makassar, and just great time. The people, the believers over there are just wonderful. I just love Indonesian uh, Christians. Um, and, and they were just eating the stuff up. But they came up with a number of different um, questions. How does this fit in with divine inspiration, mm -hmm. biblical inerrancy, things like that? A lot of the same questions that um, American evangelicals have, have asked. And so uh, when the Indonesians were saying this and they said, we'd like a popular level version of that, I thought, well, I probably should do that for the sake of the church, even though I wasn't really interested in writing it. So I had hoped to do that last year, but I had a number of other projects and then a debate uh, that came up for which I had to prepare. Um, and that took me off, uh, that just placed it off until writing it this year. And then I've had a couple more projects that have come up that have delayed it. So I'm really hoping to get to that this year, and I'm hoping to finish the book, writing the popular level version of my Gospel Differences book um, by, let's say, the summer of next year, and then maybe the spring of the following year, 2022, it would come out. Um, and then after I finish that, I'll resume my uh, research on the historical reliability of the Gospels. And I've, that's something for which I find very, very interesting and challenging. I've been coming at that from a fresh perspective. It's like, um, you know, not the typical kind of book. All right, let's look at the manuscript evidence. Let's look at what we can affirm through uh, secular historians and archaeology and historical Jesus research, what we can affirm about Jesus to see is reliable. Instead, I want to ask the question, when we consider the genre of ancient history and ancient biography, what exactly do we mean when we say, I ask, are the Gospels historically reliable? Because they operated by some more flexible principles of reporting history back then than we might be comfortable using today. Um, and this is something that I haven't, you know, made up. This is something that classicists for decades and decades have been saying, and even more recently, people like Richard Burridge and Craig Keener, Craig Evans, and others have come up with, and I'm finding the same thing uh, when I read people like Plutarch and Suetonius and, and this. So what is it, what we mean when we say historically reliable as applied to ancient literature? 
and what criteria, you know, positing criteria, I fluctuated between four and six criteria. So I, I'm, I'm playing around with this, and um, I wrote an article that was published a year ago. You can read that on my website about uh, the reliability of the gospel. Just go to my website, risenjesus.com, hit blog, and then it's one of the more recent entries there. Um, so that's what I want to get back to, and it will be based on research that has occurred over years uh, to build, a, uh, you know, to answer this question, are the Gospels historically reliable? In what sense? What does that mean? And to give an honest look at this. It sounds like some exciting work coming out of the pipeline there for you, Mike, and uh, look forward to uh, seeing the progress develop and, and the new releases in the coming years. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited about it, too. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. That's fun doing this stuff. Well, if you'd like to learn more about the work and ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona, you can go to our website, risenjesus.com, where you can find authentic answers to genuine questions about the historical reliability of the Gospels and the resurrection of Jesus. There you can find articles, ebooks, uh, videos, or even the podcast embedded on the website. And it's just a wonderful resource for those that are wanting to learn more uh, about these topics. If this podcast has been a blessing to you, would you consider becoming one of our financial supporters? You can begin your support today by going to risenjesus.com slash donate. Uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on YouTube, follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and send us some comments, some feedback about what you think about the podcast. Be sure to give us a review on iTunes if you love us, or the Google Play Store, whatever your podcast app of choice may be. This has been the Risen Jesus Podcast, a ministry of Dr. Mike Lacona. <laughs>